Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here with yet another episode of the Thriving Farmer Podcast. Today's episode is with one of my favorite farmers, Carl Hammer of Vermont Compost. Now, Carl has been making compost in Vermont for a couple decades now. And actually, in his own words, he says, we don't make soil, we participate in mystery. And I love that about Carl because their compost is, hands down, some of the best in the world, I believe, some of the best I've ever used to grow transplants in. And it is known nationwide as that. I mean, it ships as far as California, which he's quite upset about. He'd love to see a lot more local producers of compost in their areas. But this is a fascinating, wide-ranging conversation, a little bit scattered, um, but you're going to just love it because Carl shares just so much information as well as just the deep aspect of why they do what they do, how they do what they do, and what you need to be focused on in your potting mix and your soil to really make sure that your plants get off to a good start. So join me in welcoming Carl to the podcast. Um, I wish I had had multiple more hours to discuss things with him, but we had another podcast scheduled right after, so we had to cut it at over an hour. Um, So he said he'd be happy to come back on again, and if you guys want it, feel free to reach out and send me some questions, and if we get enough questions, we will bring him on again to do a follow-up. Um, so there you go. Help me welcome Carl to the podcast. Give anybody who didn't had never heard of us a quick overview. Vermont sure. Compost Company w- was founded in 1993, um, and uh, um, in uh, 94 and six, we acquired the piece of land on Main Street in the capital city that we utilize for our farm, uh, and it's a hill farm. Uh, we have uh, gravity is a big asset. Uh, Main Street is at about 900 feet, and uh, on 40 acres or so, we get to 1,100 feet. Uh, uh, so we we well, we actually have some uh, fairly gently rolling hills. Much of our farm is is pretty steep, um, and uh, we uh, we started get collecting uh we, we we really started we we were already making compost um uh on on a, a dairy farm that we had uh, uh contracted with to manage the manure excess to their cropping needs vermont uh by the 90s was starting to require nutrient management on uh larger farm operations uh, uh and uh it evolved that we became a part of the uh, management on a dairy farm to 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 uh, remove phosphorus that mm-hmm. um, that uh, was excess to their appropriate cropping needs. And um, this this you know we see compost making as the thin brown line that connects specialized husbandry to specialized horticulture. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like a streak of poop, Captain Compost. Yeah. So, uh, you know, because Vermont and many other places have this kind of excess nutrient thing on on some of their livestock operations and insufficient nutrients uh, on on crop production uh, and hay production and vegetable production. So we saw that that was a niche we were interested in, and we we uh, understood and knew that we wanted to make potting soils for greenhouse production because. Um, that were compost based and they could that were alive that would give germinating plants and early growth of plants um, that uh, uh, living soil situation uh, and uh, the good news for us over time is that that part of the business the the making of p- potting media for greenhouse growers has has good uh, margins we we are able to get paid um, what we need to get paid to um, produce the material and get it to the customer and pay a year round crew of dedicated soil makers. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, that, um, but on the way there, we were 
really wanted to, it started out as a question, could, how much of what you would usually feed chickens for grain, could you stop feeding them if you started feeding them uh, a blend of farm, forest, and community residual? Mm -hmm. And the answer we realized very quickly in 98 was we didn't have to buy any more grain at all. Mm. Period. Full stop. Which was, a sh you know, as we sort of thought about it backwards, we realized, well, all right, feeding grain to poultry it, uh, comes about after the invention of combine harvesters. People who harvest their grain by hand don't raise it for chickens historically or all but never. Mm. Uh, they, chickens might get spoiled grain. So for most of the 10,000 years that people and this jungle fowl have fellow traveled, uh, they were not being, nothing was being grown for them per, per se. They were eating at the margin of what we can't eat and don't want to eat. And, um, and, and so it's only in the last hundred years or so that feeding them um, specifically came about. And, you know, mixed, uh, mixed stock farms up until the Second World War, poultry can, subs can live quite well on what cattle and equines are not eating or uh, in their feed. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it, 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 it's a relatively recent uh, practice to feed poultry in confinement uh, and feed them grain. Uh, and in grain short world, that seems like really big news to us. Uh, and it's clear to us that the birds enhance the, the process. So in our case, uh, we bring community food in. We blend it with. Uh, we we have a uh, a herd of of mammoth donkeys that we're raising to, to support the uh, protection of an endangered uh, livestock species. And mm -hmm. we uh, so we t we have that manure. We bring in other uh, equine stable manure, and we take cattle manure and hardwood bark. And we blend those things. We make a thing called hot mix, and we then receive the food and blend that. Uh, if, depending on the supply of food in terms of the need of the chickens, we uh, we like to lacto ferment that material as it arrives. We pickle. Okay. Uh, that stabilizes the proteins. We then uh, get, let the birds have their forage opportunity. And in in Vermont, in the middle of the winter, uh, the thermal um, and you know the, the thermal bump of the compost process is very important to the birds. Uh, so yes, they're they're foraging on piles. Uh, they're kind of standing in little shelves. They make they make these little terraces in the pile, and they stand it with their feet in the warm material, uh, harvesting the food. Yes, but also fungus, bacteria, many things we don't know about that they are harvesting out of that process and they are incorporating their own very valuable excreta into the process as they do it mm -hmm. um, we then uh, take that material from having proffered it to the poultry and start the thermophilic high temperature part of our compost process which very rapidly eliminates the things that the poultry are interested in so pretty quickly once we achieve uh, composting temperatures with that material, the birds are less interested progressively in it as we roll it away from them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, on our farm, use uh, very standard tools. We don't have any dedicated compost turning equipment. We use front end loaders, and uh, well, we 20 years ago we learned how to turn the bucket around on a hydraulic excavator so that it's front shoveling. Okay, yeah. That's one of the key turning tools on the farm. Interesting. Uh, that, you know, the, the track machine eliminates the need for traction, mm -hmm. which a loader which a loader requires. So, and, and fundamentally, our process is about stacking and restacking as gently as possible because we're not necessarily trying to, we, we like to rot things. We don't own any shredders or any of those sort of violent tools we like, yeah. gentle tools. Um, and the benefit too is that um, fully evolved industrial tool, a front end loader or a hydraulic excavator 
is manufactured by many vendors competition they they certain they have value by the pound they can be readily bought and sold whereas dedicated compost machinery uh once you bought it you kind of own it you're stuck um, we, we it can be sold perhaps but to a very limited market mm -hmm. and frankly if you do that i always somewhere along the line learn to do a discipline when i'm shopping for machinery which is to take the price and divide it by the weight oh. bearing, bearings and steel cost everybody about the same you know their mm -hmm. economies of scale their advantages and so on but i always want to know what is this costing me per pound and if you take any kind of specialized ag equipment typically it it's very expensive yeah <laughs> way to buy steel and bearings it really is and um anyway that that, that has served us i think fairly well though you know the the salesman for for dedicated machine will sometimes come along and say well if you're a real composter you'd have a compost turner <laughs> uh, but some compost turners are actually destructive or they have their place perhaps but they can excessively macerate the material and since a lot of the um, process goal is to have the material uh, move air by convection mm -hmm. uh, if you if you overwork it and over macerate it you can hinder the process gotcha so you're saying the larger material really helps get that air throughout the pile yeah well and sometimes materials too large and needs to get smaller so you know wood wood chips are a thing that uh, we utilize and uh, we understand what the benefit is we don't have a chipper uh, i'd rather rot wood before i <laughs> <laughs> before i try to particle size reduce it yeah because that occupies time but not a lot of um, uh, effort or expense or fuel uh, so it's much easier to chop chip rotten wood than fresh wood uh, again uh, so uh, from a business perspective we have always tried to not own the the uh, um, high horsepower mm -hmm. tools we try to keep our equipment low horsepower how far away is material coming to your operation well we um food community food has come to us from uh, our region that extends out probably about 30 or 40 miles at the greatest extent um our farm manures uh, are much closer less than 10 miles typically maybe as much as 15. Uh, we do uh, a lot of Vermont's uh, hardwood is goes across the border into Canada to be uh, made into lumber because the Canadians have invested much more. Vermont mills are a declining uh -huh. uh, species and uh, the Canadians have kept up with their technology, bandsaws and so on. So we import uh, hardwood bark from canadian mills across the border that most of the logs are actually vermont logs but interesting they go to canada for processing and we bring bark back and we've used hardwood bark for over 30 years uh you know the, it's a very magical material bark is the the clothing a tree wears to face the world it's very bioactive and has all kinds of enzymic benefit mm -hmm. uh, that we know supports uh uh, plant growth so uh, we've been using bark for a very long time it sweetens the process uh, we use it as bedding under our equines and our poultry uh, and we incorporate it in process so that pretty much comes a, that's coming almost 100 miles to us mm -hmm. uh, that bark um, and um, if I left anything out we we do utilize a, a carbon black what some people might call biochar uh, that's uh, the top ash from a old technology wood fired um, power plant that okay. uh, leaves uh, that. So that material is about 68% elemental carbon. Okay. And it's a waste product of those mills. So we get it at a very attractive price. And we include that charcoal in our process uh, at, from the very beginning of everything gets a little bit um if i left anything out we we add some other things as condiment we uh we because we uh, have a steep site and um uh, need traction about 10 years ago we developed uh, a traction mix that is 80 percent 
wood chip and 20% uh, manufactured granite sand basalt okay. and calcium carbonate limestone. So we put those three stones at a it's 20% by volume and 80% wood chip. The wood chip prevents this mix from freezing. So okay. we can use it all winter and we can keep small piles around the whole of the farm. And we, we, we distribute that material through a, uh, a loader mounted trommel screen yep. so that it goes on at a perfect layer because it's tire hop that makes a truck tire spin when the when a tire is in the air it isn't tractioning mm -hmm. so it, if we're going to run 100,000 pound live bottom trucks up an 8% grade we don't want their tires hopping yeah so how, how we apply it, and this traction mix because it's running it goes on it's about 100 degrees coming out of the pile it's kind of melts itself into the any ice events and uh um so it's very effective for mm -hmm. traction. Yeah. But then, as the snow starts to melt or it starts to rain, it's very common anymore in our world. It rains on snow. This material dissipates the the energy of the water coming down. It, it forms into flow forms and works its way down the hill. And we have all of our water generally going into catchments that are intended to be filters. So the traction mix becomes water filter in its second use mm -hmm. uh, as it washes off and gets pushed off and we lay it on pretty thick we actually use it to manage we lay up the as the frost and ice and snow our road surfaces we we maintain the crown with this material so we keep the water off the road mm -hmm. and then as the spring progresses we we pick this material up and we we pile it and work it and we we call it we refer to it lovingly as road slop mm -hmm. but we ultimately utilize it in parts of the farm that are shallow to bedrock where our ambition is to add to achieve what the what the pre-inca aymara people achieved in the andes in peru and ollantatambo and places like that where they literally constructed a 12 foot um soil lay Wow. So we we have places on the farm where where we've added six feet over over bedrock mm -hmm. of this uh, uh, very uh, lively. Uh, remember that wood. One of the big components of a wood chip is uh, is silica. Mm -hmm. So the combination of wood chip, spilled compost, and this traction mix uh, becomes a matrix for increasing the the volume of the farm's uh, productive soils, all of which, uh, you know, in the hundred year frame is ex intended to optimize the photosynthetic potential. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So from when the material first hits your farm to when it usually leaves as like a potting soil mix, how long is that general ha happen? Oh, and I, I should say, I sometimes think of the whole process uh, as if it were a clockwork. Mm -hmm. So different wheels are moving at different speeds. Yeah. Some things go through process faster than others. Uh, and uh, in general, uh, we composts are something like eight months old at the minimum before they're utilized uh, in uh, in a potting soil or media mixed media. I should say we never use adding wood chip directly into the product that is going to become potting soil because wood chip is too non-specific a noun for us unlike say maple bark mm -hmm. and uh, so all of the, the wood chip componentry stays on the farm longer mm -hmm. uh, we did an analysis of a, a, a macro analysis of 20 years of invoice a, a quick one uh, to just get a mass balance about how much of the weight of material we brought onto the farm in 20 years has left the farm as sold product yeah. and how much is still on the farm. And I, I can say that we basically ship the light fantastic. Our sorting keeps all the heaviers close to home. Mm. So potting soil is the lightest product and goes, has the furthest reach. Embarrassingly enough, it sometimes gets to the West coast, Oregon, California, gets to the middles, Colorado, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. 
the heavier compost and 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 soil blend products that weigh more tend to land closer in Vermont, in New York, in Maine, and New Hampshire. And uh, the, the the heaviest component, the the road slop, the screening overs, and so on, is being incorporated into the farm itself. Mm. Um, recently, this question came up about whether whether more than 51 percent of the weight of product has stayed on the farm over the last 20 years because that's a statutory and regulatory thing about whether the material is principally utilized on the farm and we're now able to prove that more than 51 percent of the weight of material processed is still on the farm wow. accumulating as deeper soil um, i don't know if that exactly answered your question but from the time a fresh cow poop comes or or a bagel comes on the farm it's about eight months to a year before it is in, put into a, a mix like fort v say mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely all right so let's talk about fort v because that's kind of i think you're probably let's say your flagship product um what sets that apart from let's just say someone producing compost because i think that's a misunderstanding yeah well so um um, and uh, the word compost comes from a Latin root to 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 mix things. Mm -hmm. uh, so composting is uh, intentional blending of stuff. And in England, uh, Fort V would be called a potting compost. Okay. Uh, the, which uh, which reflects their their closer relations to Latin and uh, we tried calling it potting compost in the 90s and. Nobody knew what we were talking about, so we gave up. Um, <laughs> uh, but we make a, 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 a manure-based compost. We call it manure compost, though it also has all these other ingredients we've talked about. And at a certain point, we have that material. We call it compost. We sell it as compost. Its bulk density is high for potting media. Mm -hmm. uh, its uh, nutrient profile is... Um, uh, um, uh, well, its its pH is really high. It's uh, uh, higher in certain uh, components than are ideal for for germination and early seed production. It is a concentrate. Mm -hmm. So, a uh, material like Ford V, uh, and uh, we could take it a little step back. And how did that name come about? Uh, once upon a time, we we had a half step. We blended compost with peat. And, other, and a couple of other ingredients, and we didn't we didn't extend it to be a fully complete potting media. We uh, we sold it that way, and a lot of growers had trouble with it because they didn't amend it adequately to get good early growth. So then we started making a thing we which was fortified. That's where fort came from. Ah, and V, which we now spell V E E distinguished a potting soil made with vermiculite as a light aggregate from what we then called Fort P, which had perlite as a light aggregate because growers had different preferences about the way water attacks those materials. So Fort P ultimately became Fort Light. Oh. And Fort V got two E's because people would call up and say, um, want to buy some of that Fort 5. <laughs> and you have to, have to begin the sentence by saying, well, actually, that's V. So now Fort V, it's one of those names like Coca-Cola. It turns out to be a really trademarkable name because mm -hmm. it doesn't have any common words. Whereas, say, Compost Plus, which is a product we make and sell, is unprotectable mm -hmm. because it's made out of common words. That's very hard to protect. So uh, Fort V it is. And Fort V is our, uh, was really developed as a, a blocking mix. And the objection to perlite, was twofold one it tended to not hold up corners on a block as well as the vermiculite mm -hmm. and some of us don't like looking at perlite because it reminds us of styrofoam uh -huh. perlite is not is not styrofoam it's a volcanic glass related to obsidian that's expanded by fire and it it has a huge internal geometry that's very beneficial for microbial exchange uh, and it both holds and water while improving drainage so i've you know but it still looks like styrofoam mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh and we've made those two products for years because growers have 
uh, strong personal preferences. I, I sometimes think of what we do as having a, it, it's a three-legged stool. There's the plant material and its genetics and capabilities. There's the media and there's the hand of the grower. And those are the three legs of any plant production. And each of them is very adaptable and very variable. I mean, it, the plants, plants want to grow and they will overcome deficiencies of media and hand of grower to some degree. But our goal in making media is to really give the plant the optimum opportunity to, um, to get growing mm -hmm. and support different growers who are going to subject those plants and media to very different uh, environments. Because that's a question that comes up. Some people are saying, well, I should use a soilless mix or, you know, just peat and vermiculite or, or perlite and then some fertilizer and they don't want compost in their mix. But what I'm hearing you say is compost allows you to, it's a lot easier of a product to grow a plant in. Well, not that easier, but I will say that, that our, we do a lot of trialing. And when we, when we trial media with no living component that we always do better mm -hmm. than uh and there are you know we we wish to support we don't we don't make soil we we participate in mystery mm -hmm. uh, and there is mystery there's science and there's craft and we put a lot of effort into trying to replicate and be reliable because our customers are in business and this is really critical for them. It, uh, potting soil is typically a relatively small component in the whole cost of a plant grow. Uh, plant material itself can be more expensive, fancy than the media you put it in. Fancy pepper seeds are 60 cents a piece. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're encountering feminized cannabis cultivars that are three and four dollars a seed. Uh, so, um, the, the, we're going into 12 cents worth of media. Uh, heat, labor, overhead are all more expensive components. So really, you, if, if the media fails, everything else is sunk cost. You shouldn't have even heated the greenhouse, say nothing have committed the seed. So it is critically important that the media support the overall intention of the grower and the process. And uh, we like to think that we help our growers uh, be profitable. That is our goal. We, we really worry when a grower has a system that is unprofitable. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the things I hear people talking about is the nutrient levels in like a compost-based mix and salts. Um, and that salts can cause, you know, germination issues. But with a compost-based mix, that keeps those salt levels down, correct? Well, it depends. That's very specific to the compost. Okay. Uh, so uh, comp uh, composts can be very high. And we, we're constantly, I have a lab and a full-time one and a half people in it. We, uh, we are planting plants uh, constantly. Every batch mm -hmm. is trialed on benches under lights uh, to control, you know, photo period and, to, and the situation we grow out in the field as well. Uh, and we, one of our, constant monitorings is the electrical conductivity of mix and the salts as they're called are can be several there are several salt ions nitrate is a salt sodium is a salt potassium is a salt so uh, just knowing the uh, merely the the salt uh, content doesn't tell you which salts they are necessarily mm -hmm. um so uh, we also do some ion specific monitoring and we have standards of, uh, um, above which we will not go, but we've always taken the point of view that we should ask the plant mm -hmm. that the plant is the client and the farmer is the middle is the person in the middle writing the check or not. But so I would much rather see questionable labs and excellent plants than troubled plants and excellent labs and i've seen it both ways uh so to that end we are growing at any given moment typically a dozen but sometimes 20 different types of plants mm -hmm. uh to really and then those plants are we actually cut and weigh photograph uh all of this is to try to make sure that when the grower gets the product it's going to do the job for them mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, all of that is supported by what the grower pays for the material. Mm -hmm. Uh, And a lot of our, we enjoy, we have enjoyed over many years, tremendous loyalty from growers. I'm, I'm making potting soils for people that have been buying it for 30 years now. Uh, And we like to think that, I mean, really, shop grower is always looking to improve things, but mostly not necessarily shopping for potting soil because just buying less expensive potting soil is probably not good management. Way better off to do a labor improvement or a heat, uh, you know, a thermal improvement that that reduces your cost there uh, and stay with potting soil that works for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and really we re re upping. I mean, we've got people that have been by Well, we're into the, uh, finally into the third generation of customer. Wow. So pests and compost, I hear people ask about that. They talk about soldier flies or mites or ants. How should people be dealing with those in their compost piles? Well, pests and compost, first of all, we, we, we really adhere to, a. Uh, the uh, 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 thermophilic regime in compost making. Okay. Uh, and and part of that is regulatory. We many of our growers are certified organic, and the National Organic Program stipulates what may be called compost, uh, and that requires a time and temperature regime, uh, which we adhere. Uh, we actually believe that that temperature regime is higher than is optimal. Mm-hmm. It's 131 degrees Fahrenheit, which came from the 1978 Part 503 EPA temperature regime for biosolids or sludge, uh, and it was addressed at the then understanding about salmonella mortality in uh, in these materials. Many decades of good research since have clarified that salmonella is much more vulnerable at higher moistures than it is at low moisture. Mm-hmm. So salmonella can tolerate pretty high temperatures if the matrix is below, say, 40% moisture. But optimum composting at 50% moisture has very high salmonella mortality at about 122 Fahrenheit, especially if you do seven-day residence instead of the required three-day residence in the NOP and the Part 503. And this this points at some interesting things about rules. Very hard to change a federal rule. Mm-hmm. Uh, you need, you know, I've, it's not common to walk into a bar and have people glued to a television show about the rule on compost temperatures <laughs> and arguing back and forth about, about that it should be changed. So basically not going to change the rule. And if we're going to say we did something, we like it to be true. Mm-hmm. So we're we're kind of, but we really believe that above about 140 Fahrenheit, we start to have significant significant mortality of beneficial components like mycorrhizal spores. Uh, so we live in that small window between 132 and 140, and we achieve it. But one of the benefits of of that high temperature process for a minimum of 15 days, but we really run those thermophilic temperatures typically for more like uh, 60 days, Mm -hmm. 50 to 60 days. We eliminate anything that depends on larvae, grubs, eggs. We we eliminate insects and uh, and most pathogens that Mm -hmm. are of concern, including plant pathogens. Now, in the curing phase, uh, we expose ourselves to an ecology, the world, Uh, at lower temperatures. And um, our belief is that uh, engagement with the surrounding field and forest ecologies and increasing diversity wherever possible uh, protects the process. I I think for human health, my personal health, total microbial immersion is my, you know, how I'm, I'm going with it. And it seems to be working for us pretty well in terms of the the productivity of the soil and the it's not that we want to get rid of every pest it's we want them and manageable balance mm-hmm. uh, so uh and once again ask the plants so uh and i will say something about compost or any media it's not abstract it's actual stuff and there are no two identical piles mm-hmm. so everything is on some spectrum of acceptable or unacceptable and from a practical and business point of view 
that's why the the trialing is so important. The, we, and we we've had many. The world offers many threats. So a number of years ago came the threat of persistent herbicides, the pyrene family mm-hmm. of herbicides, and many composters may sold material that that damaged particularly plants like nightshades, you know, tomatoes, and uh, that was really catastrophic for the growers involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, we avoided that uh, both by luck and process, but we were taking many of the materials that neighboring composters were using, and and one thing that we had going for us is that we started the process of bi- what is now called bioassay, which is to say planting a broad range of plants in the material, We've been doing that for over 20 years to protect ourselves from the the really painful yeah. um, event of selling a potting soil to a grower that that causes them trouble. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, did you see that in some of the batches that you built that the herbicide? We, um, first of all, the, the, these and this is a very, would be a very long uh, <laughs> diversion to really get into talking about persistent pyrenes and their gotcha. several uh, manifestations. We think we saw some in some younger uh, um, horse manure blends uh, that we were working with. One of the things that emerged at the end of the whole persistent pyrene thing is that process probably matters because each of the four pyrenes that were of concern have very different breakdown paths. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the the uh, and i don't I, I, unless you want to get deep into this i uh, i think maybe we don't want to but some of the amino clopyrrolate is water soluble and some of the composters who were having the trouble were refluxing their leachates as part of their regulatory schema Ooh. we think that yeah we think that kept re in, reinvigorating the potential of these materials and bear in mind these persistent pyrenes are not toxic to animals as far as anyone can tell the the developers of these materials dow and dupont and so on and i spent two years in conference calls with epa and our department of ag and dow chemists and and trying to get to the bottom of how this works uh and the I became aware that the people who developed these materials were very proud of them because they are uh, they they mimic uh, the plant auxins that that are herbicidal. They are much much safer for the people, animals, and the environment than 2,4-D and other herbicides like that. Uh, they uh, 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 some plants are completely tolerant to them: beets, mm-hmm. uh, uh, oats. Uh, and frankly, anybody eats a oatmeal molasses cookie is getting fat, many, many parts per million of persistent herbicide. Uh, but these are not animal toxins. So back to the first point is the problem with them is that they kill plants. So we, by broadly assaying the material, we and, and many, many, many things can cause the first symptom of these pyrenes is uh, what's called epinasty, when a plant kind of gets blisters and twists. So our strategy included planting highly susceptible plants like red clover or beans and planting resistant plants like oats. Because if just because you're seeing plant response or even epinasty doesn't mean it's from pyrenes. It could be from... Uh, 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 uncomposted yeah. fatty lipids, uh, fatty acids can cause very similar symptoms. But if you're seeing the oats suffering the symptom, it's not a pyrene, it's mm-hmm. something else. So, back to the practical lesson and any grower, we, I used to, one of my hobby horses was when you have a crop that's really important to mortgage lifter, whatever it is, you should trial it before your main plantings. Uh You should make sure that the seed is working, that the media is working. I used to carry seeds in a plastic bag in in a paper towel. In one one plastic bag, straight seed in a paper towel, other plastic seed in potting soil, and see how the germ count is. Make sure my compost or my soil is not suppressive. and that's just self-defense. Before, you know, to yeah. put commit all your mortgage lifting seed on one day to media never having 
planted any of it. L leap ahead on your windowsill. When you get your seed and you get your potting soil, put it together and make sure that it's working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, you know, I think one of the big questions people have is why are there not other operations like yours popping up around the country? Because I know you don't like seeing it, your product on the West Coast. Well, first of all, in many places, people are trying to do what we do. Uh, it's attractive for a lot, you know, people look at, I'm going to be, have a compost business. Where is, where can I make a living at this? Mm -hmm. uh, commodity compost, you're constantly competing with municipal products that may or may not be very excellent, but they certainly can advertise lower process, I mean, lower prices. Uh, and the reason we have market in distant places is not that nobody in those places has a product that they would like to sell in place of our product. It's that those, by trial, those products frequently don't deliver full performance. Mm -hmm. So frankly, uh, you know, 27 or eight years after incorporating Vermont Compost, we're starting to think, what do the next 20 some odd years look like? And as a soil citizen, I hope that every region will have competence at this very important craft. And the question about what role we might play in helping that occur um, is kind of current business development thinking of ours. One of the things I know is that having, having this is my third compost business I've been involved in. Uh, in each of the businesses that I was involved in establishing prior to this one, when I left, the performance of the product dropped. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that's not about me having some magical powers. I, I don't powers. think this is me having a magical <laughs> connection to the, to, the, to the microbial ecology that does this work. It's about really demanding high, having very high standards about ingredients and process. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and verifying that with performance. Um, so we are in the process of trying to codify what we know, because we know we know some things and we know there are probably some other things that we don't know, because I've always been very intuitive about mm -hmm. how to lay out process. Uh, uh, I think intuition leaps over science frequently. It just gets you there faster. And then you use science to, to fill in why it might be helping, whatever the intuition was. But now we, we have a lab, we have people whose job it is to try to codify process. We're putting a lot of effort into understanding how we respond to um, changes of, of material coming at you because the material flow will always be changing. That's the nature of materials. Uh -huh. And as I said before, compost is not an abstraction. It's actual stuff yeah. you have to manage. And cautionary to everybody this is stuff that's shrinking yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so i've seen compost business plans that didn't have shrink in them oh no yeah, yeah oh no <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh we have big rule of thumb about shrink and then we measure yeah too, and it confirms our rule of thumb uh your rule of thumb's always been conservative we say it takes two and a half yards average of stuff to have a yard of something to sell mm-hmm uh, and you better you better keep that firmly in your mind as you're supplying yourself. So, uh, and we've enjoyed robust business growth over the last many years, generally speaking, over the whole time we've been making the products. Uh, and uh, that presents its own problems because we can't just hit send. Mm -hmm. We're a media company, but we actually make the media. So the part of the joke is that we're a media company with the aspiration to get profit from hitting send yes uh, and that means having the experience of setting up when i left a particular place i was making potting soil in another state in another time but close enough for us to have directly competed with that business which still mm -hmm. operates ever since within two years the product was unreliable it had weed seed we were able to effectively have people drive right by that place and drive right back by with our higher price product. Okay. And what that said to me was, Hmm, ongoing tuition and control is a thing here. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to fall off the track. 
uh, many product projects. And it, it's important from the grower who's buying this product that, it, okay, you buy the product, it works great. You buy the product again, whoops, it doesn't work at all. That's really challenging. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it, yeah, it's better to have a product that's poor performing consistently than to have it one time work great, uh, one time not. Well, and weeding your seedlings, oh. that's, that is, that's the lowest part of the bar, okay? Yes. That is not okay. The labor involved in weeding seedlings, and this is a reason that, you know, a lot of growers think, well, why should, don't I make my own potting soil? And I would certainly encourage any grower with a passion for it to do exactly that. Uh, I think bottom of the list of reasons for a grower to make their own potting soil probably is not to save money because it probably won't mm -hmm. save them money. If they make a reliable potting soil, they will have to put a lot of attention to it and they will have to buy ingredients that are costly and they will have trouble buying them as well as we do, for instance, because we buy trailer loads of things. And if you're only buying a little of it, you will pay more. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, you would make your and, and I would encourage anybody who's well, famously many people that we our customers, when we met them, they said, Well, we make our own and we're using Elliot Coleman's mix, which was uh, for years pretty funny because Elliot Coleman's been buying potting soil <laughs> from us since the nineties. Huh. Because he says, Well, I get on the phone, it comes quickly and it it's cheaper than I can make it myself. And it's reliable, and I've got somebody to yell at if I'm having trouble, <laughs> uh, all of which are benefits. Because look in the mirror and yell at yourself. There are plenty of opportunities for that in most of our farms. And who needs another one? Uh, so uh, that's Elliot's sense of humor. But yes. the bottom line is um, it probably in many it, – it, it makes good business sense for many businesses. Now, regionally – um, and what does this mean for our business going out another 20 years? We are trying to figure out how we would articulate the guidance to have the, because there's piles of poop and land and people and need in every region. Mm -hmm. And so shipping as we do, because many, many growers cannot reliably buy the performance that they need uh, in their bioregion. And, uh, we look forward to somehow figuring out how to uh, uh, exert the, enough control at distance to help other people uh, achieve reliability. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how we're going to do that yet. Sometimes people throw around the word franchise, which is a legal term of art, term of art you got to be careful about. Yeah. But uh, we're really talking about a tuition and control thing uh and and consistency and a lot of it uh, uh my grandfather who was in retail always said you make your money when you buy not when you sell mm -hmm. and you make your compost when you choose the ingredients and, and you can't you, you composter is a gatekeeper to the soil and you have to be careful because there's a lot of things that would like to find a place to go that you don't want in on your farm or on anybody else's. And that's been one of the big, uh, you know, supply side is a very important part of this, how to ask the right questions, organize the logistics and get the right materials. Uh, and then how to, everything matters. Every day is different. Every pile is somewhat different. So what are the acceptable parameters and back to the verify, uh, which is, which, you know, plants are quite willing to do for us. Mm -hmm. So maybe we're unneeded. You know, we like to think, and it's very hard for a business to imagine not being necessary. That's one of the big problems that Exxon Mobil is having mm -hmm. uh, about it. You know, unlike, say, BP, that at least theoretically sees itself as an energy company, uh, Exxon Mobil sees themselves as a petroleum company. And the handwriting is on the wall, and they cannot, they're mm. not doing a good job. Uh, so we are a potting soil company, and, but with rising trucking costs and an understanding that this capability should be more diffuse and broadly distributed. We are investing in the farm for the future, hoping and expecting that there will be work for us, uh, perhaps uh, harvesting photosynthesis in the post-industrial period. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I'm 68. And so when I talk about the 20 and 40 year frame, I really am talking about transition beyond uh, my time in this uh, enterprise. But Vermont Compost is now paying the mortgages and feeding the children of 20 full time employees. Oh, wow. That is incredible. Special thanks to our podcast sponsor, Localine, for supporting the Thriving Farmer podcast. Localine is an easy-to-use e-commerce platform for farmers to build a website, sell online, and save time in order tracking and delivery. When we tried to sell online with our farm, it was so hard. And we even had a week where a mistyped email was sending orders out into cyberspace and resulted in very frustrated customers and a very late night for me in the wash and pack shed. With Localine, everyone is happy. Easy ordering interface for the customer. Robust backend that has all the features I always wanted in a farmer oriented e commerce platform, such as charge when the product ships, no tracking refunds on scraps of paper, easy ordering deadlines and drop location integration, and so much more. I was really blown away when I went through the platform. This week, they're offering Thriving Farmer podcast listeners a free premium feature valued at $300. Two of my favorite premium features are Advanced Inventory. With Advanced Inventory, this allows you to get really specific about the products you're offering and create multiple packaging and pricing options. The other premium feature I love is their QuickBooks integration. The dreaded tax season is rapidly approaching. With a local line QuickBooks integration, you can rest assured that everything is in one place and you don't need to drown in loose leaf paperwork and sticky notes when you go to file. Plus, no one loves entering information twice. I love the once and done aspect of this one. To learn more and claim your free premium feature, you need to register at growingfarmers.localline.us. Even if you're not ready today, by registering at growingfarmers.localline.us, you can always come back and claim this offer, plus grab their free website designer today. We are supporting the growing of over 900 commercial, mostly organic mostly greenhouse customers. Wow. So talk to me about when you got started, who were your mentors? How did you learn? It's a, it's a compost science. It's, an, it's a compost artistry. I think you would probably agree with me on that. Yeah, I would. Um, well, mentors, I, I, uh, I did some reading. Uh, and I will say, coming from a dairy-influenced place, when people first started taking their manure and running it through a manure spreader and then rolling it around and getting it hot. I thought, wow, these are people with a lot of time on their hands. Uh, and, and the manure that I first utilized in my vegetable production, I should say, I come from a being generous, an eight cow hill farm in Berkshire, Vermont at the top of the watershed. Uh -huh. Jealous of all the 30 cow farms that were around me and had, fields and <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh rapidly became aware that there was no way i was gonna well i wouldn't have even been able to ship milk we didn't even have electricity and i was on a shallow to bedrock hill farm so uh, genius that i was i decided vegetables were the opportunity mm -hmm. which uh you know on the tertiary tillage i was on real vegetable growers if none were visible to me really because it was dairy farming and vegetable as for the house around me totally they were talking early 70s and we did start growing vegetables and i quickly developed the strategy of i was surrounded on both sides of my hill by older dairy farmers who were having trouble managing the manure they were producing and i did a lot of I, the, my first implement was a ground-driven 95 bushel new idea manure spreader that I bought from my neighbor Stanley mm -hmm. for 50 bucks, which was a subsidized deal. He was encouraging a teenager to do the, uh, the spreader had to be worth three, four hundred bucks. At the time. Yeah, and uh, and then I bought a wrecked, an insurance wrecked, uh, uh, a 1966 Toyota Land Cruiser station wagon long wheelbase which was a little bit lower geared than the short wheelbase and i and i bought a set of torches that was my first big equipment buy on the farm was a set of besides the manure spreader was an oxyacetylene torch okay and i cut the all the wreckage off this doodle bug as it was called that was a in vermont statute a, you could a farm tractor could be a doodle bug and doodle bug or tractor was defined by use so having cut everything off this and welding up a hitch and 
perching, the, welding up some support for the seat. I had a thing that uh, was a uh, really quite the road tractor. Uh, it would go for easily 60 miles an hour if you wanted to, and it had brakes. And uh, and I pulled this crown driven manure spreader with it, and I made a deal with neighbors on each side in, of the hill that I would spread a load of their manure for them and take a load home. Uh -huh. And all of these farmers bedded on a mix of hay that wasn't suitable for eating, so they'd put it in front of the cows, and if the cows didn't eat it, they'd put it in the gutter, or they had some hay that they didn't even put in front of the cows. And they typically, we had a chair stock mill nearby in Post Mills, and that sawed hardwood, and farmers typically went and bought hardwood sawdust. So it was a blend of, of spoiled hay, late cut hay, and cow manure, and uh, hardwood sawdust and typically it was wheeled out of the barn with a wheelbarrow and up a set of planks on a pile that was uh, really a lacto fermentative pickle mm -hmm. of, of because of all the grass in it it dropped the pH because the manure had a tendency for the pH to rise which volatilizes the protein as ammonia and if, if by adding the grass that stabilize the protein in the matrix also by the way sweetening and reducing the odor generation so by packing these grass manure packs we, by walking up them with planks and wheelbarrow it was when in the spring when you attacked that pile and loaded in the manure spur literally to go the mile and a half or so from the neighbors to home I would load a green material out of this lactofermentate, and by the time I was spreading it, it had changed color to dark brown. Mm. And so I, we were doing a very excellent management of that resource. It was a form of compost making. And uh, subsequently, I became aware that there were likely, in terms of vegetable growing, some benefits to taking it another step. One of them was to really deal with weed seed, mm -hmm. which was, I became aware very quickly as an organic vegetable grower that I did not want to be spreading grass seed yes. <laughs> with my fertility. Uh, and so I developed, uh, I, I evolved and had a tractor with a PTO and got a PTO spreader. I did start utilizing that we did utilize pto spreaders to stack the material and that's a fairly expensive operation sometimes the early in the early days would put the material through the spreader more than once and i uh, over time i learned that actually a front end loader was a more effective way to manage uh, uh compost making and could give impart all the benefits of of manure spreading a manure spreader though uh, frankly, uh, our potting soil business, we started manufacturing potting soil by mixing it on a pad and running it through a John Deere 40 manure spreader, the kind that had the drum, mm -hmm. not paddles, the drum with the, you know, it looked like a barber pole yeah. turning. Um, and that was not very OSHA acceptable because <laughs> the one person stood with a the brim pulled down on a hat to avoid taking anything in the face with a rake in the pile as it came off the spreader and raking it down and then you'd go in and harvest it above the round rollies uh and that made that's where fort v started <laughs> was with a, uh, a two-cylinder john deere tractor running uh, a manure spreader and putting it in with a gale skid steer mm -hmm. um over time, we evolved to more OSHA acceptable strategy of trommel screening. We still do very simple. We have very simple. We don't have a dedicated mixer of any kind. We depend on the operator's talent and observation to make sure we're getting what needs to happen done. Mm -hmm. And we have a, a series of steps to assure that true mixing happens. Because first of all, we're making a heterogeneous mix. It will every, in some degree, every cell in a plant tray has a slightly different mix in it that's why we don't think we don't support we don't encourage getting smaller than 128 cells because you get to the pixelation we no longer have uh, the resolution 
a 300 cell, you're not getting it. You're getting a lot of variation between cells mm -hmm. because of the sizing of the media. And a lot of times a grower who wants to go with smaller cells is, says, gee, we wish you'd screen smaller. But we think that compromises the mix. If there was a, a magic reset button as it relates to, let's say, starting over, or starting your operation again, what systems would you go back and put in place sooner? <sighs> That's a very good question. I really feel pretty good about our process mm -hmm. uh, in terms of its protection of the water and soil resources of the farm where it's executed. Uh, I really feel good about the way we manage material. Uh, I, if I had it to do over again, and I, I, I would hope that I could have had a smoother regulatory path because mm. some of our biggest most business existential and business threatening events have had to do with rules mm -hmm. and I could fault myself for not being smoother and smarter than I am. Um, I'm, I'm not sure looking back if it's fair to beat myself up about that stuff. Uh, our society has deep in it uh, squeamishness about uh, addressing the issues, uh, talking about rotting and dying and recycling Mm -hmm. loses a bunch of people quickly. Uh, you know, Alfred Hitchcock did us a tremendous disservice by making a horror movie about birds. Some people can't stand seeing seagulls or crows. Wow. And, uh, and because I'm spending a lot of time, I live in the capital city, and the Capitol Dome is, uh, I could fling a donkey turd and hit the Golden Dome. Uh, my jackass can be heard at the state house. Uh, <laughs> so I, I go down there now to the people's house and talk about these issues a lot with the fellow citizens who are charged with making policy for the state and directing its regulatory agencies. And one of the things I've been talking about lately, is, as we talk about managing the process as solid waste versus managing it as agriculture, is that in the solid waste rule, there's a lot of loose verbiage that enables the regulatory to uh, rule about vectors, which might include, say, crows or seagulls or ravens. Mm -hmm. And part of what I and I, I, um, a dozen or 18 years ago, when this question first came up about whether we uh, should be allowed to share uh, the food with crows, say. Uh, uh, I was cautioned by attorneys and my employee that when I talk about my right to solicit crow manure for my process, because we understand ourselves to be multi manurialists one of our uh, process developments is that we want to be sure that we have at least multi-gastric ruminants, the cattle yeah. or goats and so on, monogastric vegetable eaters like equines, Avians, chickens, we welcome the participation of turkeys, crows, ravens, swallows, eagles, red tails, all of whom visit and partake at our midden, midden old English word about a place you throw things to mm -hmm. recycle them. Uh, and lately I've been spouting an FAO statistic, a food and agriculture organization statistic, which goes something like this. Homo sapiens, humans, are 38% of land vertebrate biomass at this moment in 2020. 38% of land vertebrate biomass is humans. If you add human domestic animals, fowl, cattle, goats, and swine, it aggregates to 94 or 5% of land vertebrate biomass. Hmm. We are losing birds at catastrophic insects. Well, too, but I was only talking about vertebrates. That number is vertebrates. 94% of land vertebrate biomass are humans and their domestic animals. We need to share. Mm -hmm. We are pushing every all these other vertebrates out. And so when we see a crow land and pick up a piece of suet, and crows, being aviators, always unload before they take off with a load. Mm -hmm. So I can depend on them contributing their fecal bolus, which is a 
unique biology. Each organism and type of organism, a crow, a raven, uh, uh, and by the way, eagles' feeding habits are fascinating. Who knew eagles will take apples from a pile? And huh. I don't know what an eagle does with an apple when he flies away with it, whether it's a present for someone else, because my, you know, or whether this particular eagle has a passion for apples. Anyway, that's a side note. But uh, we we participate in a very intense avian and other vertebrate ecology. The coyotes have access to the midden. We don't we don't like them in the chicken house, and we have a good working relationship in that regard. Uh, foxes. So I am now. Because the solid waste rules can prohibit this, mm -hmm. uh, we we really want when a turkey comes in from the woods and uh, comes to our cafeteria and poops there, it's bringing forest biota into my pile, allowing my birds access to field and forest because they always all these birds are always eating the soil where they forage, are uh, bringing back beneficial biota to the pile, including mycorrhizal potential, which you cannot generate in compost process. You can only diminish it. Mm -hmm. Because mycorrhizal spores, are, mycorrhizae are, are host obligate. You have to have photosynthesizing plants for them to life cycle. Mm. So, so uh, you, we uh, operate our process with the hope and expectation that we will have broad range of mycorrhizal opportunity in the media and we that's part of the reason that we we try to travel that narrow temperature band mm -hmm. between legal and meeting our obligation of truth telling that we achieve these temperatures and damaging to those beneficials uh so uh we we're always looking for opportunities to bring that neighboring ecology into our process as a compost process evolves and many compost processes evolve to be on concrete slabs in uh in vessels all these things that steadily diminish the uh, opportunity for for um, beneficial biota to come in from the surrounding ecology. And we deeply believe in, in that diversity. And uh, we actually, one of our strategies is to grow known beneficial plants on media and then incorporate that media into process. We call that glomelon grow. Mm. And we have substantial amounts of it. Now we need to then make sure that it we've managed the weed potential mm -hmm. for the weed seeds we think of fort v if i were going to be uh the diction you know the merriam webster of biology of of process and i would be the czar and i would say soil is defined as material that has had a succession of plants and what we are providing is a latent soil mm -hmm. free of and the grower gets to choose the genetics of the first order of plant succession. Mm. That's a very uh, uncommon event in nature, mm -hmm. uh, a latent soil like that. You know, volcanoes can do it, and we do it. Uh, uh, you know, a, a soil that has not had a plant succession. Yeah. Which is what the product, which is the production need of a 2020 greenhouse grower. Absolutely. <laughs> And we uh, work. We've done a bunch of work with microgreens people over the last number of years to talk about reutilizing the mm -hmm. material. To think about a microgreens tray as a as a, a a part of the farm, a tillage base, not a consumable. Yeah. Because microgreens growers, in specific, have the opportunity to rotate through a broad range of plant families. Yeah. And somebody would say, well. You know, there are a lot of people who caution, well, no, I dump the mix every time because I don't want trouble. But frankly, if you're putting, growing pea shoots, you have put a huge investment of pea material mm -hmm. in that tray. And you grow two sets of shoots and the, they start to get tough. Yeah. Well, it's a per flip it over and grow some mustard or drizzle some because you got to kill the peas or they'll come up in the mustard. So that's the technical issue about how do you reutilize that huge um, 
fertility opportunity represented by the pea material and dittos plants like sunflowers so and you know from a business point of view for us i'd love to sell you a drizzle of fort v that you utilize over time and one of the benefits is that microgreens production benefits from a larger volume of soil mm -hmm. because the root to shoot plants growing at their in their best photosynthetic photosynthetic opportunity typically have higher shoot root volume than sh than plant volume trees do if they have the opportunity most plants have more biomass subterranean than above ground and that's the buffer for health so when you try to run too little media you add stress so if you can reutilize the media almost indefinitely you can run more media and that gives you huge benefit in in a production like microgreens mm -hmm. yeah we got a couple clients who are you flipping at like six to eight to ten times right and perhaps drizzling in some material to get the seed bed and so on and then you know it becomes uh it and at the end at the end i had one grower who looking very perplexed as i'm doing a workshop on this and hey he came up to me out and he said well the problem for me is that's how we produce eggs because <laughs> we we do we do that cutting of of the microgreen and that's how we're feeding our chickens and that's what they're living on is those cut, harvested media yeah i said yeah well okay you know so if that's if that's the solvency for your system fine and you know though you could probably feed it you could probably get a couple uses before you feed it yeah uh, and the, that root mass is a huge amount of material. It's exciting when you start doing red, red, you know, look at beet roots that are bright red. Basil roots smell like basil. The root mass is uh, a significant part of what you're producing. Mm. And it's utilizable for ongoing production. Mm-hmm because mm -hmm. the sun drives all of this it's all about photosynthesis i la sometimes like to characterize compost as the catalyst for the second stage photosynthetic drawdown the root exudates because sometimes people talk about the carbon you're putting in soil with compost and that's relevant and worth calculating but that's not the key value of compost making uh, if it was, you would put the compost right in the ground without making compost because you always combust some carbon and make some CO2 in your compost making. And that is one of the calculations we try to do in, in managing a process is to have it have the highest uh, mass balance yield, keep as much carbon in the matrix as possible, consistent with achieving the other goals that have us manipulating the material in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And try to remind ourselves that it's the sun that drives the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about, um, you're in Vermont. There's a lot of new farmers uh, popping into Vermont and popping up all around the U.S. and around the world. What do you see some of the biggest mistakes that they're making are? Well, they they wear themselves out and hurt themselves is one of the long range concerns. By uh, they their determination is so powerful, their yearning to get it done and be doing it can be quite can be hurting them. Mm. Uh, so, and and what are the components of that that could be mitigated with craft and support? Um, the, uh, the, so the next thing I would say really broadly is that they are trying to farm with inadequate fertility and unbalanced fertility. Uh, it used to be completely understood in, by, by the Renaissance that the limit of your acre, the productive acreage that you could farm was how much fertility you could bring to bear. Uh -huh. And it's much more profitable to farm less land and have it yield well than to spread out and have poor travel over a lot of land and have it yield poorly. So mm -hmm. one piece of sort of provocative advice I have made and in podcast context is if I were addressing a, a bunch of young vegetable growers, 
want to be vegetable or produce growers, I would recommend that they start with poultry mm. because that's the fountainhead of the fertility. And the other thing that is one of those useless pieces of good advice is get the right farm. Mm -hmm. Don't. Some places are going to be too hard to try, and some of them are going to be easiest to buy, but too hard to try. Because no one so, else wants it. <laughs> yeah, and it, or it's too... If, if you're going to sell food to people, being far away from people is a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be surmounted. You get great land far away where nobody will bother you and wholesale it. But out in the... I come from far away from people farm up on a mountaintop, and we did farm it, and we grew some very, very good food there, and we made it work in some ways. Partially, it can now be admitted because being isolated was beneficial in terms of our main cash crop which they were looking for with helicopters but <laughs> our vegetables enabled us to intercrop in a way that we never actually the helicopters never landed uh so that can now be discussed more openly than it once could the statute from limitations has run but um over time realized that and i left that farm and went to another state to be in the flow of things because we had a thing that was working and we were we were growing a lot of things and we had a broad crop range and we were evolving away from that part of what had helped us capitalize that was illegal and therefore unsustainable and we were really starting to make it with the legal and sustainable part uh, uh, but we were on top of a mountain and I suddenly I had a yen for more impact on the larger cultural emergency mm -hmm. which is always a scary motivation and so that led me to the siren song of bigger and and going to a place where there was a lot more tillage and a lot more people and a lot more uh compostable opportunity uh and that was a, a several year run that blew us back to vermont because we weren't loving the the political environment we were functioning in and we we were pregnant and we went back to vermont mm -hmm. and took a look around and said all right what do we do now so we moved from a very rural mountaintop to a farm on main street in the capital city mm -hmm. and others have said well that was dumb from a regulatory point of view <laughs> <laughs> and that may be the case uh it 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 gave us the combination of <laughs> impact and uh, enabled us we get it, it, it makes the the food we feed our chickens is a, a a resource that we can actually go out with a team of animals and gather that mm -hmm. and we actually started uh, moving food in town with a team of mules in a wagon it, we quickly degenerated to trucks because we really didn't have the i was the only teamster in our in our situation mm -hmm. Uh, but we still have ambition to put the animals to work moving food to the farm from the community. Uh, and uh, though we did, I mean, current events in the farm is that we now have a box truck with a lift gate and we're hauling food again mm -hmm. because uh, the market for food has gotten royally and we lost our, our local food supply to a... a a fairly big industrial solution, a DPAC machine, which enables big generators like supermarkets to combine their plastic and throw it in the can, and it goes to a $600,000 machine in Maine that separates. Uh, though the, we have some serious questions about the long-term sustainability of sending all our food to Maine or the desirability mm -hmm. of doing that, and also the sustainability of this machine not the least of which is how much plastic ends up in the, mm -hmm. we know what comes out and that that has to go to incineration because it can't be recycled, but also how much finely divided or microscopic plastic is going onto the fields. And we, I have had that, I've been whining about the biological um, significance of finely divided plastic in food soils. I've been whining for 40 years or more about it. Now there's a fairly broad understanding of a couple things. One is that finely divided plastics are in the sea, they're on the land, and they're in the sky. Mm -hmm. And that ship has somewhat sailed, but I still think it's worth resisting 
increasing the loading because mm -hmm. the volume of plastic in soil, since the plastic is not bioaccessible, or at least not yet, well, that's going to change too. We are aware now that in mangrove swamps, there are ecologies that are literally utilizing the carbon and polyethylene films over a five-year time frame. Whereas as recently as 2000, uh, a plastics engineering handbook would tell you that polyethylene is probably good for, and they used to say four to 500 years. Where they got that number, of course, is the same place that a lot of numbers come from, which is a bunch of people with credentials to guess something like that. <laughs> guess it yes. and write it down and it's in a book. And uh, we hope, I hope, I have, I have a deep optimistic faith in microbial uh, rescue. I think you know, microbial communities are adapting constantly and they're not listening to words much. We used to have a joke, you know, well, you can fool people not that hard. Use say a bunch of things, use some words they may or may not understand. They might accept what you're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, plants, a little harder. They're not necessarily listening to what you're saying. Our job as greenhouse growers is often to give plants the satisfaction of thinking they're getting what they need, but maybe not giving it to them the way they're used to it. You know, you plant a seed in the ground, it can forage over a broad range of space. You put a whole media in a cell, you've now really gone many orders of magnitude less world for that plant. Mm -hmm. We can do that. So we are in the business of tricking plants into you know, get basil. Basil doesn't like rumor of winter. So we, we put it in a warm spot and we don't let it look out the window and we give it soil and we heat that soil to support the microbial community that, that that basil plant partners with. Microbes are really hard to fool. You keep calling it hardwood bark, but it's really turned into a pine mm. bowl chip. Uh, microbes are not utilizing it like hardwood bark anymore. The CN ratio has changed enormously. All the enzymes have changed. The fungal communities that are native to it, because wood carries spores. Mm -hmm. A lot of mycorrhizal traffic is, mycorrhizal spores are in the bark. Mycorrhizal um, involvement in a, in a plant, it goes all the way from the root apical tip, I mean, from the apical tip to the root radical. It's throughout the plant. Mm -hmm. And mycorrhizal services include the transport of amino acids directly across the chloroplast. Mm -hmm. So that is in defiance of the agronomic textbooks of my training, which said the only ways that a plant can get nitrogen is as ammonium or nitrate. And that turns out to be absolutely untrue, which explains a lot of plant phenomena we've observed over time. Plants routinely, with microbial assistance, take amino acids from soil and move them across the, the chloroplast into the, the leaf. Uh, and it's, that is the future of, of understanding how to support optimized photosynthesis, which every farmer's job is optimizing photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. And that is how we will recarbonize the 8 billion hectares of land that we humans have decarbonized over the last eight to 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I have to wrap up because I've got a next podcast interview right after yeah. this. But Carl, thank you so much for your time today. I mean, we could have gone on for three hours, literally. And I'll Yeah, well, and if, <laughs> if at some point you want to direct more focus on practice or on plant work or whatever, you know, um, yeah, let's, let's yeah, do it. Absolutely. When is your, do you have any idea when your compost class may, may be coming out? My compost class. I know I'm you. Sorry, did I make it sound like I was about to do a compost class? Well, at some uh, point you may have said that you thought about offering some sort of training. Well, we, we are <laughs> thinking about what business model, gotcha. what a business model might look like to kind of provide the guidance and feedback. So we know it includes doing lab work for, mm -hmm. for, uh, for, for clients or partners in other places. It would include uh, perhaps setting our Main Street facility up as Compost University. Mm -hmm. uh, it might include, yeah. So this is the, uh, we're talking about a larger business plan. Right now, 
our our business grew sales of over 17 percent growth year on year wow. which uh you know we always have to make this stuff and make sure it works and we also dance with the ones that brung us so we're not we get we take new customers after we make sure we satisfy old customers yeah uh, because we we respect the loyalty and we respect that the, that over time these customers have learned to profit by using our stuff so we're pushing the walls on we're we're pretty of my 20 people there's nobody except me full-time thinking about where we might be going mm, yeah and even i do a lot of other things too uh you know or, so uh but 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 we 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 know that we aspire to evolve our business to be good soil citizens which means that every region will have competence at this important craft mm -hmm. and what how could we develop a business model that pays us to do that mm -hmm. gotcha as we as we evolve the pear orchard uh, and vineyard that our farm is intending we intend to evolve it into mm -hmm. Because uh, one of the things about, and this this informs our process, so we don't pour concrete. We operate on, we're constantly adding soil appropriate materials that we make compost upon with the intention and expectation that when the need diminishes or disappears for compost making, we will have fantastic photosynthetic opportunity mm -hmm. in all those work surfaces and this is one of my objections to certain kinds of engineered uh, uh, facilities and also to rules that require paving which mm -hmm. many rules do mm -hmm. and we need we need to look at the cradle the long term and we have we have in our history many situations where we turned a compost project in the place where the need diminished. Ben and Jerry's closes a factory in Springfield, Vermont, and we turn the nearby compost project into a hayfield. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's Absolutely. a much better hayfield than it would have been before we had the compost period. Yeah. Carl, where can people find more about you? Just VermontCompost.com? Uh, VermontCompost.com. Uh, is is I wish it was a better place than it is. We are currently, for a change, trying to improve the website. Right now it's spring, so we're. Uh, but we look look for improvement there, and uh, there are uh, various podcasts and videos out and about. But we do have some video on the the website that we think is helpful and useful. There is a, a reading list, I believe, uh, and like that. All right. And we will point people, we'll put a show notes where we'll include some of those videos and stuff so people can find out more information. Yeah. And uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk with you today. Oh, absolutely. Always a pleasure. Anytime. All right. See yeah. you, Michael. Bye. Bye. All right, guys, so that's the end of the official interview with Carl. But Carl and I, when I got on the phone with him, he was sharing such great information right at the beginning before we started the official interview. I wanted to add that here so you can listen to that as well. Enjoy. I'm just at a meeting on a chicken farm with just leaving a joint House and Senate Ag Committee meeting with the poultry farmers for compost foraging to try to get some legislation to support the practice of feeding food to chickens. Okay. <laughs> yeah, anyway. All right. Um, Very cool. Because I know that was a struggle that you guys were like kind of arguing or fighting with them on if that was actually legal. You know, it's been a, a conversation that for over 20 years now, uh, we, we started the practice of feeding community food to laying hens in 98. Uh, we've, we've produced uh, eggs for sale every day of every year since 1998 without buying grain for the birds, which to me would seem to be the big news about, you know, about the whole thing rather than an ongoing, it keeps resurfacing the question about whether this is a farming practice. Yeah. Um, and we, and we thought we had really settled it in about 2006 when both the agency of agriculture and the agency of natural resources issued separate written decisions the agriculture department saying that it is a farming practice and the solid waste division of the agency of natural resources saying that if you 
if food is separated from solid waste with the intention to feed it to animals that it has not been discarded mm -hmm. and that therefore they did not have jurisdiction uh, and the practice over time expanded around the state a bit to where about nine or ten farms were producing eggs by feeding chickens and composting the residuals and in the last five years there have been about 15 complaints from about five individuals about things like crows or odor or those things so mm -hmm. it's not it hasn't caused a significant amount of trouble but for whatever reason the agencies kind of got together lately uh, last year and decided that the feeding of food to chickens was not a farming practice but a solid waste practice and that to continue the practice practitioners would need to get solid waste permitting oh boy now in a lot of cases and, and not so much in our case at uh, vermont compost uh, for reasons i can get into we i think we can get a permit for the practice um, yeah but in a lot of towns the a solid waste permit would not be an allowed use in the ag district yeah um so and and that triggers all kinds of regulatory challenges potentially that with quite a substantial cost burden uh, making the process which is already you know producing eggs for sale is hard work and doesn't pay very well mm -hmm. even uh even if you i mean many in many confinement operations 70 percent of the cost is the grain yeah or the feed um we take away that cost but we add labor uh and um and so we've you know, egg production is a is a karma yoga thing. You do it because eggs are food that people need, and that we all eat eggs, and we try to be as solvent as possible on egg production. But it's very hard to um, cover the reasonable wages for people doing the work and make money with uh, you know a global pricing or eggs at about a dollar seventy a dozen. Mm -hmm um so we always gave the tipping revenue from the accepting and managing food to the egg part of our <laughs> the, the egg enterprise so the chickens <laughs> had the revenue from the tipping so that they could afford their their cow manure their horse manure their hardwood bark their spoiled crops their person their loader and their house yeah uh, and uh, and that you know we get four dollars for our eggs we could sell a lot more eggs than we're currently producing we're in it we actually are in the middle of this regulatory uncertainty building a new chicken house and uh and changing the way we get food we've had to undertake the hauling again after many years but um mm -hmm. Hey, Thriving Farmers, and that is a wrap with Carl. Now, Carl, unfortunately, I had to go right after that interview to another interview, so I didn't have enough time. So we've re-kind of worked the process so we give them more time with the guest so that we don't have to get cut off tight like we did with uh, Carl there. Um, but um, we will have Carl on again. As uh, If you have more questions, feel free to send them in to our team, and we'll make sure that we book him again on the podcast to talk about you know, what you want to hear from Carl all about building soil. So joining me on the podcast next week is Katrina McAlexander. So Katrina is a orchardist and so she raises a fruit in the Pacific Northwest. They have a winery. They have a cidery. They are um, doing on-farm events. They are doing school tours. Uh, they have an on-farm restaurant. So she has really done a fabulous job building out her farm to support her community. And it tells. So I, it's, it's a fabulous interview. A lot of heart she shares about why she does what she does, um, why she set the farm up the way she does. And she actually still works one day a week off farm. So we go into that and why she does that and how that's that entire operation is set up. So join me next week for this fascinating interview. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.